my lords, ladies and gentlemen. This world is manifestly an unjust place. Professor Alexis Jay's report on systematic sexual abuse in Rotherham was published in August 2014. The Jay report findings were horrific. 1,400 mainly white girls and young women had been sexually abused and in some instances tortured in and around Rotherham for the best part of 20 years by predominantly British Pakistani men. Prosecutions followed Jay's revelations and to date, 19 men and two women have received prison sentences for the abuse for which they were responsible, some dating back to the 1980s. One of the ringleaders has been imprisoned for 35 years. All this is well documented alongside sadly similar patterns of abuse in a number of other British towns and cities. What makes the Rotherham situation particularly shocking was the failure by local officials from Rotherham Metropolitan Borough Council and from South Yorkshire Police to act on reports of this abuse over many years prior to 2010. Some of the abused girls themselves attempted to make reports of abusive behavior directly to the police. They were ignored. The charity, Risky Behaviour, was set up by Rotherham Council in 1997 to work with girls aged 11 to 25 who were thought to be at risk of sexual exploitation on the streets of the town. A youth worker, Jane Senior, was the project coordinator from 1999 to 2002. Senior found evidence of what appeared to be a local organised grooming network in Rotherham. Such was the quantity of her evidence, including reports from many victims of abuse, that Senior was advised by the police to forward her evidence to an electronic drop box on the South Yorkshire Police computer system. She learned later that the police had not read the reports that she had left there, and that the information could not be accessed by other forces. Rotherham Council itself came to view risky business as a nuisance and the project was shut down by the council in 2011. To cut a long and very complex story short, Senior eventually published her own account of what she had experienced and learnt in Rotherham. Further official reports have been published, not least by Dame Louise Casey, into the failure of Rotherham Metropolitan Borough Council to deal appropriately with reports of abuse over many years. Some investigations continue to this day. For now, I'd like to invite you to take a step back from the immediate impact of an appalling catalogue of abuse and the failure to address it. I focused on the Rotherham story because I know the town at first hand. I was vicar of Rotherham during the period 2003 to 2007 when this abuse was at its height. I knew nothing of it then. It suited the perpetrators and apparently the borough council and the police not to talk about what was happening. But I was familiar with the town's culture and the social and moral assumptions that enabled the abuse to flourish. Lest we damn Rotherham as a northern town with a particularly degrading and degraded culture, let me write the balance. Rotherham is a metropolitan borough of some quarter of a million people, mainly white, but with significant British Pakistani and some other smaller British Asian communities. It's a very mixed place, with pockets of deep deprivation alongside more prosperous working and middle class areas. All ages are represented among its population, and the town and its satellite communities have all the amenities you would expect for a borough of its size. Yes, it's had to deal with significant challenges over the last 30 to 40 years, the closure of the coal mines and the reorganization of the steel industry. Jobs and job opportunities have changed. But Rotherham is not untypical of many South Yorkshire towns, 
with a resilient, down-to-earth population, the vast majority of whom are good, well-meaning citizens who care passionately for their community and want to see the town and their neighborhood and their families flourish. Yet, when the Jay report was published, it was revealed that this deeply abusive behavior had not only taken place over many years, but had been allowed to do so despite attention being called to the issue by victims, by professionals working with the victims, and indeed by Andrew Norfolk, a Times journalist who brought the scandal to national attention. The failure to address the abuse was subsequently attributed to a number of factors, including race, class, and gender. To put it simply, no action was taken because of assumptions, cultural assumptions, fears, and a corporate blindness which existed among the town's leadership and in the wider community as well. Just one little example to illustrate from my own experience. In Rotherham, contemptuous and sexist attitudes were commonly expressed towards the mainly working class girls who were the victims of abuse. The language used by some across all ethnicities was telling. Girls and young women who hung around the taxis or the clubs in the town centre were often called sluts or trash. They were assumed to be easy meat out for drugs or alcohol or sex because that's what they wanted. These girls were simply not believed when they spoke of being victims. They were treated with contempt, their human dignity denied. Injustice flourished unchecked for far too long in Rotherham. Sadly, the town's reputation was shattered and will take years to recover. The cost of injustice has been huge, even global in its reach. I was appalled, appalled to learn that Brenton Tarrant had daubed the name of Rotherham on one of the magazines of bullets he used in the massacre in Christchurch, New Zealand last week. But of course, injustice in society is not confined to obvious cases of the abuse of the vulnerable. Opportunities for good education, the possibility of earning a living wage, fair access to means of legal redress, to decent health care, and freedom from slavery, social oppression, and the threat of violence, by almost any measure of what it means to be able to flourish in UK society, and according to several well-respected recent surveys, 30% or more of our children under the age of 18 are the unintended and unwilling victims of an unjust distribution of opportunity and wealth compared with the remaining 70% of their contemporaries. The same case could be made for many other vulnerable social groups, the elderly who live on their own, those with disability issues, those who are homeless, all experience the day-to-day -day consequences of inadequate social provision, limited freedom of choice, and so on. Furthermore, the experience of actual or perceived injustice is not limited to the least well-off or the most vulnerable in society. More than once, I've had to listen to husbands and wives in the midst of divorce proceedings, bitterly complaining about the unfair division, as they see it, of their assets. Never mind what the law says or what the children require by way of support, the partner with the greater assets unfailingly resents the injustice of having to relinquish substantial assets to the other party. Most visions of a just society, at least in broadly Western social traditions, might be said to be based on ideas of common human dignity and value, of truthfulness, hope, a belief that social and individual change for the better is possible to achieve, underpinned by freedom of speech, equality of opportunity, and the rule of law as guardians of those values. These values are given expression in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which whilst not using the word justice within its text, spells out the basic rights which many would argue are essential markers of a just society. 
For a properly just society is a society in which relationships between individuals, communities, institutions, even nations, are rightly ordered, where human dignity and value are celebrated, where all citizens have the opportunity to participate in the government of their community and nation, where all have equal opportunity to access education, healthcare, and the law, where goods, housing, and pay, I would argue, are available according to need, where diversity is acknowledged as a strength, where freedom of belief is a norm, where human flourishing in all its diversity is possible. And despite some well-documented failures, and I've mentioned one of them, we can see these characteristics in much of British society today. British citizens do have the opportunity to participate in the government of their communities, locally and nationally. Our election system is well run and is guarded by laws which are enforceable. Remember the outcome of the local election in Tower Hamlets and the subsequent prosecution of those who sought unlawfully to influence the outcome of that election on the 24th of May 2014. Many children resident in the UK do have access to a good education. We have an NHS which may be creaking, but which is still in principle available to all at their point of need. On the whole, British citizens live in a society underpinned by principles consonant with generally accepted values of social justice. But our society today is not perfectly just. There do appear to be some yawning chasms between the reality in which we live and our aspirations to live in a more just society. I want to argue that there are at least four major challenges, probably more, but four I've picked on, which we face if we wish to work for a more just society in the UK today. And the first challenge that we face is that of human nature itself. It was the philosopher Thomas Hobbes who famously observed that life outside society would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In Hobbes's view, human beings are all basically selfish, driven by fear of death and the hope of personal gain. Hobbes argues that all of us seek power over others, whether we realize this or not. In fact, you may think you're a long way from Hobbes's view, but in fact, we all live as if Hobbes's view of humanity is to some degree realistic. For if you don't accept Hobbes's picture of humanity, why do you lock the door when you leave your house? Presumably, it's because you think there are many people out there who would happily steal everything you own. On Hobbes's terms, and perhaps ours, only the rule of law and the threat of punishment keep us in check. Well, whether or not we go wholly along with Hobbes and his view of human nature as intrinsically selfish, it's certainly true that the vast majority of us are inclined to act from mixed motives much of the time. Seeking a more just society is something that many of us may wish to sign up for, but there are competing claims on our attention and resources. Which comes first? my pay rise so that I can feed my family well, or ensuring that someone who has no job gets sufficient benefits on which to live? Should a baby have specialist care which may extend her life by a few years but costs half a million pounds? Or should the money be spent on a clinic which can offer detox opportunities to 100 people addicted to drugs for the next two years? Both might be just choices, but on what grounds is a just choice to be made? At worst, we can be so set on our own or our family's survival, on our rights, cares and personal responsibilities, that we simply ignore any consideration of the wider good of the community or society of which we are a part. In that sense, we can be described as quite Darwinian. We are animals wired to ensure our personal survival. The cynic might argue that what passes for so-called altruistic behavior on our part 
is often to our benefit, as well as to the benefit of others. What we happily call a win-win situation. So, for example, I might choose to direct all my charitable giving to the local hospice, where, in the fullness of time, I might expect to end my own days. I am looking after others now, but also with an eye to my own well-being in due course. Yet it's also characteristic of humans that we can do better than that, at least sometimes. Take people who have freely given their lives so that others might live. Famously, the Roman Catholic Polish priest Maximilian Kolbe offered to take the punishment which was being meted out to a young Jewish father in the Auschwitz concentration camp. Kolbe was placed in solitary confinement and starved for three weeks before finally being put out of his suffering by a camp doctor who injected him with a lethal dose of carbolic acid. The young father survived. He survived the war uh, and lived to tell the tale. Working for justice, in this case protecting the lives of others, is possible if challenging. It can demand acting with courage in the face of deeply embedded instinctive behaviours. Second challenge we face is our inheritance of unjust social structures and skewed expectations. Perhaps you remember, I'm sure you will, the expenses scandal 10 years or so ago over the road in Parliament. MPs had been caught on the horns of a dilemma for many years. They alone were and are responsible for deciding the level of their pay and had come to believe with some justification that the electorate, that's you and me, thought that they were overpaid. Yet the MPs had to pay for their own secretarial help and other research assistance. The figures just didn't add up. And the expenses system had come to be used as a means of topping up what MPs needed in order to function well at Westminster. There were no effective checks on the system and abuses took place, famously with a duck feeding station and a moat alongside generous housing arrangements and so on. Public exposure, some criminal prosecutions, and attempts at a massive overhaul of the expenses system followed, with much firmer monitoring put into place. But at the root of it all was public ignorance and envy, quite as much as any veniality on the part of some politicians. We all inherited and connived at an unjust system and then sought to shift the blame away from ourselves. The temptation to moral corrosion across society is never far away. Our third challenge is the wide range of views over what constitutes justice or just behaviour across differing cultures and communities. Matters of gender and sexuality receive very different treatments even among communities in the United Kingdom, let alone abroad. Perhaps you have read about Andrew Moffat, assistant head teacher at Parkfield Community School in Birmingham. Moffat has been awarded an MBE for his work on developing equality education in the school, including the No Outsiders programme. No Outsiders includes lessons on LGBT issues. However, 98% of the school's pupils are Muslim. And the No Outsiders programme has caused outrage among some of the children's parents, who claim that the programme is anti-Islamic. Here is a clear clash of opinions over what constitutes just behaviour. Moffat is trying to ensure that the pupils become familiar with current liberal British attitudes. I don't suppose he's trying to change their minds, just make sure they know what's going on. The pupils' parents are seeking to guard their cherished Islamic cultural norms of behaviour. Which should prevail? 
Or what of the cases of families keeping their children out of mainstream education and only teaching them within the very narrow confines of a particular faith, as has been the case with some madrasas and yeshivas? Here in schools are examples of the clash of differing views of just behavior, of just education, and of what constitutes the provision of justice of opportunity for children. The fourth challenge is broader still. The UK is but one nation in a global community of interdependent nation states. The need for some sort of arena to enable the peaceful resolution of conflicts and the development of what were known for many years as friendly relations between states was recognized in the aftermath of the First World War. The League of Nations was short-lived the United Nations has survived for longer. Its soft power is still significant through such bodies as UNESCO and UNHCR. But its power to enforce resolutions passed by the Security Council is virtually non-existent. Take another institution. The International Court in The Hague has brought successful prosecutions against individual war criminals, for example, former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba. But in reality, the international community has few institutions with power to take effective action for the promotion of justice. With a vacuum internationally, it is left to superpowers, the USA, China, or Russia, to claim moral high ground when they attempt to justify their own actions and interventions uh, in other countries. We observe, I think, more from the sidelines nowadays, although our history uh, is no better. The ability to negotiate effective treaties which might promote just behavior between states is entirely dependent on geopolitical circumstances and national interests. So perhaps we should simply admit that a just society is impossible to achieve. I want to argue against this council of despair. Last week, Claire Foster Gilbert argued that a way forward might be to view justice as a direction, as well as a goal, a moral compass bearing, which we can seek to follow as boats might follow a compass bearing at sea. As a way into what this might mean, let's consider the fundamental taproot of justice at least as we inherit it in Western democracies and here in the UK in particular. The three Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity and Islam all assert that the root of justice is divine. God's will is for all people, all creation, to exist in just relationship with itself and with God. And the influence of Judeo-Christian traditions on how we in Britain think about justice, and in particular how we shape our system of justice, has been and continues to be profound. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the activity of doing justice and the quality of being righteous go hand in hand. I'm not speaking here of being self-righteous or morally superior to others. Righteousness is a divine attribute, implying holiness and goodness in the very best senses of those words. To be righteous is to act justly. Righteousness is the quality God has and we may have. Justice is the outworking of righteousness. And the purposes of righteousness and justice are straightforward to mend broken relationships between God and people and between each other, to protect the vulnerable and thus to enable all in a society to flourish. The biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann speaks of justice as God's earthly form of holiness. So divine justice in the traditions of the Old Testament is not fundamentally about fairness it is a radical notion of distributive practice that gives to each one what is needed in order to live a life of well-being. In theological terms, 
The God of the biblical writers is partial, prone to mercy, unjust in common human parlance. The prophets give a devastating critique of Israel's social practice in their day, insisting that there is no wealth, power, knowledge or privilege that can make society safe when the most elemental requirements of neighborliness are disregarded. God's people are called to care practically for the vulnerable, the stranger, those without adequate means of support. This quality of righteousness is given real meaning in day-to-day -day commerce, familial relationships, in the generous treatment of immigrants, and so on. All of life is meant to be geared towards just behavior. And underpinning these ideas is a profound notion of agreement, covenant, it's called, between God and his people. God will remain faithful to his people, protect and sustain them. The people in turn will give allegiance to God and act justly in all their relationships. At least they'll try to do that. The covenant is a sort of divine social contract, which has been and continues to be paralleled in some of our own contractual social relationships, even today. Those of us who are British citizens have contracted relationships with the state. If you hold a British passport, you have certain rights and responsibilities as a citizen, just as the British state has responsibilities for you, especially if you're traveling overseas. The public institutions of this country generally strive to enact this contractual relationship with British citizens. They seek to ensure just, but this may not mean equal, access to resources according to need. Benefits exist, in theory at least, to ensure that no one falls into absolute poverty. Of course, these systems sometimes fail with horrendous results. Look at the mess that the poor implementation of universal credit has caused in communities nationwide. <coughs> Public servants are not to blame, particularly. They do not always have sufficient access to the truthful reality of how people manage their lives in practice. And politicians are not perfect and can enact inadequate laws or fail to enact laws at all to protect the vulnerable. <clears throat> what then might be done to begin to promote a more just society amongst us? I never thought I'd be saying these words, but it may look deeply unfashionable, but might we work to recover a confidence in what have traditionally been termed the virtues, righteous virtues even, of goodness, truthfulness, and humility. These are among the bedrocks of just behavior, the markers of a just society. We lose them at our peril. When fake news reigns, when economic success at any cost is idolized, when contempt for others is broadcast far and wide on social media, when fear is puffed up into egocentric swagger, then justice withers and tyranny looms large over society. We would do well to be bold for humble, virtuous living, to cultivate patience and kindness in our personal relationships and in our institutional life to enable justice to flourish in our midst. The prophet Micah put it neatly, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? So to return to those four challenges I outlined earlier, perhaps we might make it our business to encourage altruism, putting the needs of others First, we'd need to work against our instinct for self-preservation, maybe find the humility to learn from other cultures which are more in touch with their communal roots than we are here in the West. We may need to create opportunities to meet with people very different from ourselves and to learn to listen well. 
Might we not aim to be more honest about our social inheritance and sometimes skewed points of view when it comes to institutions? Perhaps we need to cultivate ways of owning up to our responsibilities and where we have failed to act to ensure that the vulnerable are protected. We may need to learn how to be more alert to our own tendency to moral co corrosion. And I say that to myself as much as to any of you, particularly when I reflect on my role in Rotherham. And in a multicultural society, we struggle with differing ideas about just behavior and expectations. At the very least, getting to know our neighbor and enabling them to get to know us would be a step towards better understanding. In the end, our democratically agreed laws are what safeguard our freedoms and those of all cultures who have settled in the UK. Those laws need to be understood within real neighborly relationships and then observed for the sake of us all. And finally, the establishment of effective means of developing just behavior between peoples and nations, a long-term and seemingly impossible task at the moment. But diplomats, politicians, and all the rest of us must not give up. That way lies injustice and violence. As Claire encouraged us last week, do what we can, but don't beat yourself up about what you cannot do. People of goodwill need to be prepared to work together for justice. We need to buck the blame culture that seeks to find scapegoats whenever anything goes wrong. We should be truth seekers, not blame finders. Those who seek to uphold our constitutional arrangements need our support. Of course we should be critical when we believe that unjust decisions are being made in the courts or in Parliament or by people in public office. But then we need to suggest positive alternatives, get involved, seek to make what changes we can for the better. A more just society is only going to happen if we seek to make it happen. Don't leave it to others. Is a just society possible? Well, I suspect that a just society is not going to be achieved by human effort alone. Such are our mixed motives and the complexities of the society in which we live. But even so, a more just society is certainly worth working for. As one rabbi memorably put it, God made the world unjust in order that we might work for justice. It is the direction we choose which is important. We need to be bold and to choose that moral compass of justice whose wavering point invites us onwards together to seek the well-being of others, whatever challenges lie ahead. I have one little postscript before I stop, and it's a postscript to the Rotherham story. It's been reported this week, you may have seen it in the papers or on social media, <laughs> that some of the Rotherham victims are being compelled, even now, to disclose in DBS checks convictions they received when they were being abused. This happens when they apply for jobs or even for membership of a parent-teacher association. The offences include soliciting, possessing an offensive weapon and assault all actions forced upon the victims by their abusers, forced upon the victims by their abusers. The victims can never put their past behind them. In the process of enacting an absolutely essential law which protects the most vulnerable in society, safeguarding them, in other words, our legal system is in fact perpetrating an act of injustice against women who were themselves victims of abuse. We cannot rely for justice in our society on systems, on institutions and laws alone. They will always prove, to some degree, inadequate. For true justice, we have to look more widely than systems and deep within ourselves. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Jane, for a very interesting and uh, wide-ranging uh, review of the subject, a subject which uh, obviously is something of great interest to me and uh, very important that it was wide-ranging because uh, for someone like me can be tempted to think of justice as what uh, the court's laying down at 9.45 on a Wednesday uh, morning, but of course it goes much more widely than that. Now, do any people have a question? I have a question, but I found after 40 years of civil service that someone else generally asks my question, so I'll keep mine to the end and see what happens. Yes, sir. We have a roving mic. There we go. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Do you think that a misguided belief that this is a just country is one of the biggest threats? Um, well, yes, we can deceive ourselves, can't we, and forget that we need to ask the questions, are we? And I've tried to, I mean, I think in some respects, there are some important respects in which we have some very important pillars of justice, if I can put it that way, uh, in place in this country. But, we're, as I said, we're not perfect. If we deceive ourselves, if we think we are perfectly just and get self-congratulatory about it, we can always do better. So I agree with you on that. I'm really thinking of Rob. Rotten, yes. Where the girls were at fault. We the girls were at fault. At fault, yes. Yes, it was. And uh, the, the, I mean, there were, I think other examples of this, but yes, the, the, the girls were thought to be, nobody thought of the girls as girls in their own right, in, hu you know, in human terms, and took them seriously. Um, and I remember them queuing outside the clubs and at, at the taxi ranks and so on. Uh, at, you know, and to many people would say dressed in, you know, the, the, the assumption, well, they were dressed inappropriately and this, that and the other. They were caught in a web they couldn't get out of. Um, uh, so, yes, I think it, this has been a very interesting, telling, painful um, experience through, through Rotherham and the other, I mean, there are other places now as well. So thank you for asking the question. Yes, question down there. Thank you very much indeed. It's more of a, a comment, if, if that's all right, and I'd very much like to hear your views on it. Um, the, the, the instance of knife crime here in, in, in England has reached the stage of moral panic, and you know, the, the government is doing something about it. However, um, experience and, and uh, research shows that in Scotland, in Glasgow in particular, um, over the last few years, the incidence of knife crime has been substantially and significantly reduced by approaching it from a public health point of view. That is, including the police and the hospitals and the schools and the youth clubs and everyone to be involved in it. So in fact, what, 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 what it was a sort of group, it was a community effort to deal with this and it has been enormously successful. We very, very rarely use that public health model to deal with social problems and I guess that it goes back to something you were saying about each one of us has to take responsibility and we have to 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 allow people to somehow come into our community to belong and to have a sense of belonging because otherwise the more urbanized people become the less the, the more alone they are and therefore the more prone to perhaps unjust behavior possibly Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I would, <clears throat> I think the Glasgow model is a very interesting one. Um, I haven't, I mean, maybe some of you know why in England that hasn't been really picked up. Um, I'd be interested to know because it's, it's proven to have had a big success rate up there. Why shouldn't it happen down here? I don't know. It costs money. But in that case, it's a question of priorities. And do we think that's an absolute priority or not? I mean, interestingly, I, I think it was Matthew Paris wrote a little article the other day talking about uh, the f it, this is sort of fashion element to it. I suppose this is picking up the copycat question uh, when, when particular p p behaviors multiply because they're given publicity um, and then die down again. But I think it's a very costly fashion, if that's what you, if that's what you want to call it. I'd much rather go down the public health route and, get it addressed properly. Now, somebody else, I'm sorry. Yeah, someone else, yes, here. Hello, um, I just wanted to pick up on uh, your comments made about the DBS process. Um, I, and I think many colleagues, and I'm a teacher, feel it is very unjust that for 
one, 2% of people who behave in a completely unacceptable, reprehensible way, we have to be subjected to a DBS check. It takes an enormous amount of money. I don't believe it really achieves any greater safety. I personally have a conviction for traveling on a train without a ticket, and I'm in very good company because a, a certain lady called Sherry Blair had the same thing. Um, and this was over 20 years ago, and it comes up on my DBS check. It can never be spent. We think we're protecting, but we're not. And if money is an issue, we could save a great deal of money by taking away the bureaucratic approach of the DBS process. And now nobody will say that because you'll get labelled a paedophile, but it does need to be looked at. Is this an appropriate way of going forward? Mm. Um. Uh, there's not only teachers who have to do... I've got more DBS certificates in my filing cabinet than hot dinners, really. Um, uh, and, and it's true, there are inadequacies. It's a snapshot and all the rest of it. That, that It's difficult. Um, on the other hand, we have to have some way in which publicly we can acknowledge that safeguarding is, is taken seriously and actually acted on seriously. Now, for my money... If, it, and I think anybody who runs the DBS system would, would, would say this. Uh, it's, the DBS itself is of limited use. What's of much more use is interviewing, it's getting to know the person, it's doing the, the kind of much rounder sort of checking that should happen before someone is appointed and then keeping everybody sort of monitored and so on whilst they're in, in, in work, which involves work with children or adults at, harm, at risk of harm, I think is the phrase nowadays. Um, so I have sympathy, I have quite a lot of sympathy, um, but I, we, we are in a very difficult position at the moment in this country, and we've gone down this route of, of DBS checks. The, the danger, I think, is, is, is thinking that that solves the problem, and you're quite right, it doesn't. It only is a, it's a very small part, a small and expensive part of what, what's needed is a much wider checking. I just want to come back with one point. You say you've got many, many copies of DBS. Um, I drive to my friend's house, I go through six counties, I don't have a different driving license for each county. You shouldn't need a different DBS for working in this school, working with Cubs. Work. So another example of, I think it's Capita is the, the one who runs it, but might be wrong, of money wasted and money going out of our education system and out of our charity systems and care systems. So I just wanted to come back on that point. Okay, and, and, I, and I think I can, I can gloss that by saying it is possible to have a portable DBS certificate now, which you get one and then you, you can carry it around with you, but you have to register and it's a bit complicated. Enough yes, on DBS. Yes, gentleman, gentleman here in the orange tie. Thank you, Jane, for a beautiful lecture. Um, the prophet Micah addresses himself to us as individuals. And I think your, a lot of your lecture was about addressing the lessons to us as individuals. But I think the problem in our modern life is even more difficult, which is we also have to make our organizations act justly. And I think this question of the DBS is a perfectly good example of that. And there are plenty of other examples around us where, for example, in the Home Office, to be invidious, uh, a policy was introduced that was uh, morally justified to reduce immigration, and it got turned into a hostile environment and terrible things happened. So we ha it's very, very difficult to get organizations to act justly and to remain just. Uh, of course, individuals have a duty and obligation to try and keep them on the right path, but it gets extremely difficult. Uh, so there is a, a real problem about not just individuals, but collective action. Um, I agree. Um, and um, Claire's lecture last week addressed some of, had, had a good go at some of those issues. Um, so how vigilant or how we set up ways of, of keeping up our organisations uh, under examination, if I can put it that way, and open to that. Sorry, I think. I, but I think the story of Rotherham is about um, the leaders 
of institutions and of the community losing their moral compass. Um, and there, and so there is a uh, one of the. It's true that um, communities need to act, individuals need to act, but you also need leaders in institutions and communities to step forward and to act with a moral compass, righteously and justly. And um, I, you were there, but I wonder why in Rotherham that didn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen in national institutions. Um, uh, what happened in the Home Office to the Windrush generation um, was a shocking failure of um, people's moral compass. And at every level, people have to step forward, as you said, and say, no, that is the wrong thing to do. There may be an overall policy, or there may be an overall approach in this community, but we have to act against it. Now, there were individuals in Rotherham who did that, but they didn't have the authority of leadership in their communities. And those who were in authority, for some reason, either ignored it or didn't know what was going on or didn't step forward. And so this is partly about leadership. Yes, I, I agree with you on that. Um, and uh, looking back <coughs> uh, to my experience of Rotherham, I could only speak, I was the vicar, I have to say, of the town centre, the minster, right, the town, and I knew <laughs> the leaders of the council and the rest of it. Um, I think there was a lot of fear around. I think there was, particularly then, it was, uh, when I was there, it was just at the moment of the um, uh, invasion of Iraq and all of that, there was a great fear about stirring up um, division in Rotherham uh, between peoples of different ethnicities. Uh, and uh, so, a absolutely, you're, you, you uh, in fact, I didn't quote today, but there is a quote in one of these official reports uh, that one of the people who'd been commissioned to write a report, uh, somebody called Adele Weir, was told, when she presented it to council officials, was told that she mustn't mention the Asians because that would, that would stir up terrible trouble. So there was some failure of kind of moral leadership, a failure to address truth, to, be, to want to be truthful, to be honest, and then to deal with it. Now, whether they doubted themselves or they just thought, we, we've run Rotherham Council successfully for the last 50 years or whatever it was, and nobody's going to tell us what to do or what, I don't know. It, some of those things I saw in, I, I've seen a whole mix of reasons why people did or didn't act, not just in relation to this abuse, but in other instances there. Um, uh, frankly, it needed some big truth telling, unavoidable truth telling, and then, um, and then action. Uh, rightly, it had to be taken from outside the council. And they were stood down and commissioners brought in. But you're absolutely right, it was a deep failure of leadership there. Thank you. Yes, lady there. Yes, mine it's about justice. And as the gentleman speak about um, the Windrush generation, the disgrace that they went through, a lot of these children was born in this country, and the justice that they get, it was no good, really no good. And the second point is um, the justice for Stephen Lawrence when he lost his life, and that was no good, and that was also a disgrace. So I mean, at the end of the day, I can only speak, I'm gonna speak about Jamaicans who came here, and they came here and they worked very hard, and the disgrace that they went through, he shouldn't have done, so I really hope we are Christians, and we have to work with each other and ask God to help us. Will justice be possible? We don't know. So thank you very much. That's okay. You're welcome. Yep. More questions? Yes, it's right at the back there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question or get your thoughts um, on something that um, kind of goes back to the original question of whether a just society is possible. Um, and I was really struck by your comments on opportunities versus, well, not versus, but as well as neighborliness. Um, and I wonder whether you have any thoughts or any comments on the idea of, we talk a lot about injustice um, for those who don't have opportunities um, and those sorts of things and whether we need to think a little bit more about the opportunities that we're offering our friends and our neighbours that advantage them against people who don't have those opportunities, who don't have those neighbours who have, 
you know, links into various work experience opportunities and those sorts of things. So just kind of flipping it around, not about offering more opportunities or whether we need to actually think about how we or how we offer our friends and our neighbours things that other people don't have access to. That, that's very interesting because it's it, quick and easy, isn't it? Yes, I know a way I could get you a placement at such and such. I'll just pick up the phone and ring Fred or whatever. Whereas if you were, for example, to um, join the local, serve at the local Citizens Advice Bureau or join a local charity that does work with youngsters, you could do that for them if you see what I mean. If you have an appropriate sort of voluntary organisation or whatever, or a school or whatever it is, I mean, it depends what your thing is. So it, that's a very interesting question, and I'm looking back over my own behaviour and thinking, <laughs> um, but uh, to, how to make the the wealth of contacts that we might have um, available in a in an in as honest a way as possible uh, to a, 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 a people in in by need, if I can put it that way. That is that that's kind of what you're driving at. Yes. Mm, well, it does happen. I mean, you do, you do hear of people giving away mm. and explaining, giving back to the community to them yeah. is, is doing that sort of thing. But to be encouraged in that sort of way, I think, yeah. uh, sounds a good way to go. Yeah, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful that you included in your talk a recognition that any understanding of what justice is is inevitably going to be subjective. Uh, and that's one of the significant problems that we face, I think. Given that, um, there's been some interesting work published recently about the way in which um, more just societies, generally speaking, seem to be those societies where uh, the distribution of wealth is, is flattest, uh, so the, ex the difference between extremes is, is smallest. Um, I lived for a time in one of those societies uh, in Norway, uh, and what was interesting about that was that um, or oh, one of the many things about interest, interesting about that country was that uh, it's a very legislative environment, or it was in the 90s anyway, to the extent that it wasn't possible, it was against the law to take your child out of inside if the temperature was below a certain degree, I can't remember what it was now, let's say minus 15, but it was against the law to take your child out if it was minus 15. Um, and it just occurred to me that... So Norway is one of the more just societies, it seems, from this, this recent research. Um, places like the United Kingdom and the United States, which are much less legislative uh, and regulated, are amongst the least just societies, according to this research. And I just wondered, therefore, whether there is something to be said for regulation and a recognition that there might need to be in a just society some limitation on what individuals are allowed to do with their money. I, mean, I think we've probably given up on any idea that we might ever all be able to have the same amount of money. But perhaps a just society will say that you may not, for example, buy nuclear weapons to defend your property. I think we already do say that. But perhaps we, already, we might also then go on to say you may not buy health care or education. Yes, that's very interesting. I mean, just to, uh, uh, just to continue the conversation, it's not really an answer, but just to kind of it set me thinking. Uh, when I was quoting those Judeo-Christian traditions, uh, I mean, set out as a huge corpus of law in, in the Torah, in the first five books of the, of the Bible. Uh, and um, um, one of the provisions there is for what's called the Jubilee. So every, every now, we don't know that it actually happened, but anyway, every seven years, uh, you were, farmers, the, they were farmer people on the whole, uh, were supposed to give back to their workers um, the, uh, it assumed a kind of flattening out every seven years so that everybody st had a chance to start again and see where you could get to. Now, some people, you know, in the following seven years would rise up and others would fall down, but it's every seven years you were supposed to say, right, we're going to have an amnesty and we're all going to start afresh. That was there. So they kind of wanted a, a kind of regulation way of managing the priorities that they understood this, 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 this justice would allow. The way you've set the question just there, or the positive, was freedom versus um, versus good behaviour, but versus uh, um, regulate. Yes, versus regulation. Um, both of which, uh, in the examples you've given, have no one of which freedom, which you might think would be essential to justice, has led to injustice, and regulation, which you might think would be contrary, has led to. Um, 
I, uh, maybe there's something there about who assents to what and whether, you're, whether you have the freedom actually. So if, if by government the Norwegian peoples vote that that's how they want to live, fair enough for them. Um, whether we would get to that point it, or more to that point over here, I don't know. I don't know. Some of you may have other comments in relation to that. It's an interesting question. Thank you. Well, that, that was really vaguely in the zone of my question, which is where people draw their... Uh, understanding of what justice is and what is just to them. And you did touch on this in your lecture mm -hmm. about people having different cultural assumptions and, and that. And that is something which I think is, is very difficult in building a just society because, you know, just taking my own parochial interest, you get visitors to the court who are saying, well, I don't exactly call this British justice, but, you know, they have different notions of, of where justice should be and, and drawn from, from different traditions. So it's, it's, uh, it's your sort of question is around, can you impose a, an understanding of justice that would collectively a society would subscribe to? And I, I, I find the idea, of, I personally, you are, this betrays my roots, find the idea of imposing something quite difficult. I, I don't have, I find that rather unjust, uh, but, but then I'm making assumptions about uh, having an active uh, engagement with how we govern ourselves, uh, which, which means that even if I have to, in this country at least, it's first past the post and so on, if we have to have a referenda, <laughs> um, you, you have to accept the outcome, so in that sense, but at least I have in principle a way of, of voting into something. I find this idea of imposing from outside quite awkward. Yes. I mean, don't know about others here, but... Yes. It's interesting that you said um, sort of this idea of imposing from outside and yet I think of the people that I meet at the food bank where I uh, yeah. go along where people don't have the freedom because of their situation. Isn't it really a, a question of inequality of opportunity quite often which makes for a, uh, an unjust society? Um, yes, I, I, absolutely it is. Um, I mean, I don't know what in Norway, for example, whether they will have to run food banks for people or whether it's so flat that actually everybody has sufficient because by regulation that's how it works. But in this country, uh, it's, that inequality is entirely um, unjust and is, a, is a, sadly a, a very sharp example of where things can go wrong. Yeah. Yes, lady here. It was very interesting, and thank you for talking to us. Can I just say to you that yesterday I was at the House of Commons uh, at a meeting uh, about Yemen. And uh, I just want to... Re I know nothing about these things, but I want to raise the point that they made. Uh, all the aid agencies, ministers of state, the whole lot. And what they said was that when there is a war and a breakdown, gender-based violence rises. I think you can extrapolate football. There's been stuff on that about football in the United Kingdom where domestic violence rises. There's a correlation. So, um, how do you, you know, how do you see Rotherham in those terms? I see it that there was a breakdown uh, in all the institutions, and in that uh, wild west, the uh, perpetrators were able to get away with literally terrible abuse? Well, I think that was part of it. Uh, the business about lack of leadership was part of that breakdown. I'm, I'm not sure that it was all of it because I think um, the, the fact is that uh, certainly when I was around there, the different communities, ethnic communities in Rotherham did not know each other. They didn't. I mean, it was just, it was when you, when you did occasionally, uh, I remember being invited once to go to the pass, passing out parade at the end of a madrasa year. So all the boys who'd learnt the Quran off by heart and so on were getting prizes. I found myself doing some prize giving. But it was very unusual 
to have anybody there who wasn't from within that community. And similarly, uh, the various white communities, they just didn't mix much. Well, that's, that's going to be part of it. It's, so it's not just about institutions. I'm not saying that they don't carry you know, a bit of weight for that and the failure of leadership and so on. I think, it, I think it's a wider issue than that that was to do with the way, um, I don't know, the way different communities thought about themselves or even, for all I know, think about themselves even today. I don't know. Well, you have to accept that it's a breakdown of law and order, that. Well, it, it, it clearly, yes, <laughs> I do accept that, and there was clearly a breakdown, and there were clear problems with policing and so on that was going on there, but I don't necessarily, I, I think the causes, the underlying causes of that are broader than just breakdown. It's difficult to work out chicken and egg, and that's partly why some of these investigations are still going on, to try and get to the root of what was going on there. Um, there clearly was. I mean, there were drugs problems and all sorts. There were all, there were all sorts of things going wrong. Um, but but I, it would be very nice to be able to say, well, it was that. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was that, 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 that. I, I think there were a lot of things going wrong at the same time, I'm afraid. We've got time for just one or two more. Yes, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you spoke of justice as being the outward aspect of righteousness inner righteousness. You also mentioned about uh, Abdul Rahman. You didn't name him, but you spoke about Tower Hamlets and the electoral uh, law being enacted to replace him. What hasn't come up is the word courage. In all walks of life, particularly those in uh, positions of authority, in the Abdul Rahman case, it took I think four or possibly more individuals to actually bring the case against Rahman so that the, you know, his preference of the Bangladeshi uh, community was, was seen to be what it was and his threatening behavior, etc. And so he was you know, barred from office. It took the courage of individuals to make that move in the same way as Gina Miller took uh, Mrs. May to, to task over a proclamation, which, which is what it amounted she was relying upon. So it does behove each of us, and I think this is what, what comes across to me most clearly from, from what you're saying, that each of us, each of us sitting here, and each of us in positions of whatever influence, whether it be um, whatever role we have in life, that there is that need to be courageous and to actually acknowledge that justice, there's an expression, justice has fallen in the street. I can't remember where I've heard it, but um, that, that's often the case. But I would quote someone such as Edmund Burke, who said, what holds society together is these little platoons, these wonderful institutions, small though they may be, that actually are the glue of society. And they hold really the, the, the nation's heart in their actions. And so though we need to deal with institutions and courage obviously needs to be uh, expressed. Uh, I mean, Lord Denning spoke a lot about courage. It, it's really finding the men and women who will actually speak. Um, we, we all know what, when we don't speak, and in a sense we need more people to speak truth so that uh, it encourages the rest of us. Thank you, and I, I, I underline everything you say. I absolutely agree that having the courage of our convictions uh, and being prepared to speak about that and to act on that is absolutely key to actually acting justly, not just thinking it, but acting. Thank you. I think that's probably a very good comment to uh, conclude the questions on. So uh, thank you very much for everyone who's asked questions. <laughs>